Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us in the Grand Rounds. Thank you, Dr. Kilgar, for being able to make it to our Grand Rounds in such a short notice. I think we're planning for April, but thank you for agreeing to come today. Um, Dr. Kilgard has a um, um, long history of working in um, antiepileptic drug development. He is part of the um, um, UCB complex. He's a fellow in new medicine uh, from Belgium and has um, had extensive studies in human physiology <clears throat> um, from University of Copenhagen in Denmark and for the past three decades has worked in development of antiepileptics in the pharmaceutical industry and uh, we're happy to have you join us in our grand rounds and discuss. I think it's going to be an amazing learning opportunity for our residents and students. <coughs> I'll send the microphone to you, Dr. Kilgard. Thank you very much, Dr. Pulati, for the kind introduction and uh, thank you all for taking the time for, for me to to share what during my 30 years with antiepileptic drug discovery without question has been the most fascinating experience I could dream of, namely the discovery of levetiracetam and the whole journey following that discovery that have finally led to the discovery of, of buracetam. Um, with, with the popularity of levetiracetam or Kepra, very few r recognize that the whole beginning of the journey for levetiracetam was very, very cumbersome. And that can actually be illustrated in, in this table, which shows you results in the two classical screening models for anti-epileptic drugs, the so-called MES test, maximal electroshock seizure test, or the pentulene tetrasol test, PTZ. In that test, you can, you can apply compounds to testing and uh, try to uh, observe if they can protect 50% of the animals uh, against seizures. If that's the case, we quantify the anticonvulsant activity with an, an ED50 value. And if you go down the table, you will observe that all the classical anti-epileptic drugs works in at least one of these two models. It was therefore, um, uh, met with a lot of skepticism when we announced that levetiracetam has no anticonvulsant activity in either of these two models. And the reason we actually stumbled upon levetiracetam was that it works in animal model of genetic epilepsy, namely sound sensitive mice. And then when further testing levetiracetam, we observed that it, it actually also works uh, in models of acquired epilepsy like the Kindling model. And very interestingly, if you change one maximal electroshock in a normal applied to a normal animal from small electroshocks applied chronically to initially normal animals, you induce an epileptogenic kindling process and in these fully kindled animals that will have seizures to a previously non-convulsive stimulation, we could interestingly observe that levetiracetam do have significant anticonvulsant properties. And that preclinical profile was never uh, seen before and actually made us challenge the whole concept of the acute seizure models arguing that inducing an acute seizure in a normal mice or rat is not a model of epilepsy, it's a model of seizures. So I think the whole experience with levetiracetam actually taught us all a lot when it comes to which models could be relevant for antiepileptic drug discovery. But it also showed that likely levetiracetam must associate with a truly novel mechanism different from the two classical classes of antiepileptic uh, drug uh, um, mechanisms like sodium channels or, or GABA receptors. For that reason, we invested significant efforts in trying to understand the mechanism of action of levetiracetam. And one important study was a study where we applied labeled levetiracetam to homogenates taken from either the central nervous system, cerebellum, cortex, hippocampus, or from peripheral organs like the lung, the kidney, the spleen, the pancreas, and so on. You see here in red bars the specific binding of labeled levetiracetam and in green bars you see the non-specific binding and the results really speak for themselves. There was a brain-specific binding of levetiracetam uh, and interestingly when we tested this against combination therapy with a number of known antiepileptic drugs, none of them could displace levetiracetam from this brain-specific binding site showing that it was really unique to levetiracetam. <clears throat> 
And we could also early demonstrate that there was a correlation between the affinity of levetiracetam analogs for this binding site and the anticonvulsant activity, showing that the binding to this site exert a functional role in the anticonvulsant properties of levetiracetam. So we wanted to understand the molecular nature of this binding site, but that was complicated by the fact that levetiracetam only has a moderate affinity for this binding site, a so-called PKI value of 5.8. So therefore, we had to generate a new levetiracetam analog that we could label and which would possess much higher affinity. And as you see, this was obtained with UCB30889. And actually doing studies where we looked at the ability of a number of levetiracetam analogs to displace either this analog 3889 versus levetiracetam, we could see a very strong correlation confirming that this new analog actually recognized the same binding site as levetiracetam and therefore could be used in a number of biochemical studies for further delineating the mechanism, uh, the, the molecular nature of the levetiracetam binding site. This slide uh, contains a lot of the findings we ob ob observed and obtained and actually represent years of, of work. But two uh, observations was really, really crucial to discovering the molecular nature of the levetiracetam binding site. And one was the fact that the binding site seems to be associated with synaptic vesicles that you only find in the presynaptic terminal. And then secondly, that the expected molecular weight was around 90 kilo Dalton. Because this surprising anatomical location of the binding site to synaptic vesicles and the molecular weight enabled us to identify a number of candidate proteins for the molecular nature of the binding site. And then we cloned them. And and one, one family that had obtained a significant interest for us was the so-called synaptic vesicle protein 2A protein family class, which consists of actually three isoforms, the SV2A, the SV2B, and the SV2C. Because interestingly, in the literature, it was reported that if you knock out the SV2A gene, then the animals will have seizures and actually die of seizures, so potentially connecting SV2A with the molecular nature of the levetiracetam binding site. And we conducted a number of experiments that finally proved that SV2A is the molecular nature of the levetiracetam binding site. And one key experiment was conducted in animals which were deleted for the SV2A gene, SV2A knockouts, animals deleted for the SV2B gene and double knockouts deleted for both A and B. Using a specific polyclonal antibody and Western blotting, we could show that we did find SV2A in homogenates from brains of wild type animals and animals deleted only for the B, SV2A B gene. Whereas we lost the, the binding, we lost the, the interaction of the antibody uh, when there was a deletion in SV2A in, in uh, monocytes or when we had the double knockouts also being deleted for both A and, and B. So we, with this background, we conducted studies with the 3889 analog that I just described to you, and we could show in homo homogenates from wild types a, a very significant specific binding of this uh, levetiracetam analog. However, we completely lost the binding when we had deleted the animals for the SV2A gene. The binding was then back again if it was a deletion in SV2B, but lost if the, the double um, 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 knockout had occurred for both SV2A and SV2B. So this experiment clearly showing that SV2A is the molecular nature of the levetiracetam binding site. Having this discovery, we did experiments where we looked at the correlation between a number of levetiracetam analogs for their affinity towards SV2A, human SV2A, and their uh, ability to produce anticonvulsant ED50 values. And we actually observed a very strong correlation, which really confirmed that binding to SV2A for levetiracetam must 
have a functional role in its anti-epileptic properties. But there was still a lot of skepticism that SV2A could really be an anti-epileptic drug discover, uh, target uh, because the field had been used for so long to see that it should be mechanisms related to other ion channels or receptors like in particularly the GABA receptor. So we conducted a number of studies where we confirmed uh, with further target validation that SV2A is indeed an anti-epileptic drug target. Um, and I've shown you already uh, the, the first two experiments, but an interesting experiment that also was obtained was when we did the kindling that I explained to you earlier, we could observe that if there is a deletion of the SV2A gene, then we have actually an accelerated kindling development in these animals, showing that SV2A seems to be inherent to uh, epile the epileptogenic process. And then really important, we could uh, test levetiracetam versus valproate in animals which had a 50% a, a reduction in their SV2A uh, protein expression in the brain. And in these animals, levetiracetam lost a significant part of its anticonvulsant effect, whereas there was no impact on valproate. So really confirming that SV2A is indeed the anti a major anti-epileptic target for levetiracetam uh, and, and also that it, it is really a, a truly novel target that levetiracetam at that time did not share with any other anti-epileptic drug. So what is really SV2A? Well, it, it, there is an illustration on this cartoon. cartoon. If you look at, at the left side of, of the slide, you see in orange the SV2A protein being incorporated in the membrane of a green vesicle. And these vesicles you find in the presynaptic terminal where they contain neurotransmitter that upon an action potential getting into the terminal uh, in, inducing an exocytosis process will result in the readily releasable pool of the vesicles to fuse with the membrane of the presynaptic terminal and release their content of neurotransmitter. If SV2A is deleted, so there is no SV2A protein expression, this has an impact on the pools of uh, vesicles. And in particularly, you see here in the pool, which is the readily releasable pool uh, of vesicles, you have a fewer number if there is a deletion in the SV2A gene and, and, and protein. And this emphasizes the, the, the belief that SV2A is actually involved in the maturation process of vesicles more proximal and their diffusion to the membrane where they are re ready to release their content of, of neurotransmitter. So um, we, we knew that we had a correlation between affinity for SV2A and anticonvulsant activity of levetiracetam analogs. However, we also knew that levetiracetam, although it was the molecule that enabled us to identify this novel SV2A mechanism, only had a moderate affinity for SV2A. And in addition, we knew from, from early days that levetiracetam had other non-SV2A mechanisms that we were concerned could actually impact its adverse effect profile. So taken together, this triggered an interest in trying to exploit the therapeutic benefit by this discovery of SV2A in a program that actually was looking for selective high affinity SV2A ligands that hopefully would enhance the anti-epileptic properties and the adverse effect profile of that compound compared to, to levetiracetam. So for that reason, we in, in initiated at UCB a major drug discovery project that uh, screened 12,000 compounds for their in vitro interaction with SV2A. Out of these, 1,200 compounds were tested in vivo for their effect against autogenic seizures in mice, and out of these, 30 compounds were profiled broadly in animal models of seizures and epilepsy. All, among all the 30 compounds that was profiled broadly, we always had one out of two profiles, which actually led to the nomenclature of saying we had 
um, two different families named after the lead compound in both family. And one was the Briveracetam family, and the second was the Silitracetam family. In the Briveracetam family, all the compounds did have, for instance, activity in the two classical screening models, MES-PTZ, although at relative high doses. And they had, in general, more non-like seizure effects in the epilepsy models, for instance, having much more anti-ictal effect than we have ever seen with, with Liviticetam. In contrast, in the Silitracetam family, the profile was more like for Liviticetam, even though we pushed the doses hard of these compounds, we never found activity against MES and PTZ seizures. And the epilepsy uh, uh, profile, the epilepsy model profile, was more or less like what we've seen with Liviticetam. So for that reason, we found that most benefit came out of deciding to develop Briveracetam in the clinic as a new anti-epileptic drug. And the key question is, of course, did that result in a new SV2A ligand that is inferior, similar, or superior to Liviticetam? And I'll try to show you a preclinical comparison now of Liviticetam and Briveracetam regarding mechanism of action, pharmacology, and pharmacokinetics. First of all, Briveracetam is different from Liviticetam because Briveracetam is selective for the SV2A mechanism. It has no other mechanism as Liviticetam has. Again, first of all, Liviticetam has a moderate affinity, as I mentioned earlier, for Liviticetam. With Briveracetam, we have increased that affinity 15 to 30 fold, uh, to 30, 15 to 30 fold higher. So we have a much higher affinity with Briveracetam for SV2A than we do have for Liviticetam. If I look at the other mechanisms that we know associate with Liviticetam at relevant free brain concentrations, we know that Liviticetam can counteract high voltage activated calcium channels and it can also counteract AMPA gated currents and all at rel therapeutic relevant concentrations. However, even though we test Briveracetam at significantly higher concentrations than therapeutic relevant, we still don't see any effect on any of these two mechanisms. And I believe this is very important because the reason we probably have seen with Liviticetam behavioral adverse effects in a subpopulation of patients, we believe relates to the fact that it inhibits the AMPA receptor. Because interestingly, if you look at, at the, the, the anti-epileptic drugs on the market, there seems to be three drugs that has a higher incidence of behavioral adverse effects, and that's to pyramid, pirampanil, and levetiracetam. And these are the same three anti-epileptic drugs on the market that uh, interfere with the AMPA receptor. So uh, the fact that Briveracetam do not have any other uh, mechanism than the SV2A make me confident that in general there should, it should be better tolerated uh, and, and have fewer of the behavioral adverse effects. And by the way, the good tolerability of Briveracetam was something we showed in our clinical trial program where as the first drug ever, Briveracetam was developed without any uptitration of dose. We started out directly at day one with with the um, with the, the fixed dose. So let me just explain a little bit about the the differences between Briveracetam and Liviticetam when it comes to physical uh, biology, and. In order to, to do this properly, let me just remind you that the vesicles that you find in the presynaptic terminal exist in three pools, the reserve pool, the recycling pool, and as I mentioned previously, the readily releasable pool that are ready to fuse with the membrane of the presynaptic terminal and release its content of neurotransmitter. So when an action potential traverses the, the membrane of the presynaptic terminal, it actually opens the calcium channels so calcium can diffuse into the presynaptic terminal and stimulate the isocyte exocytosis process, whereby the vesicles fuse with the presynaptic terminal membrane and release their content of neurotransmitter. This is then followed by a sort of kiss and run pro uh, process for most of the vesicles, which initiate the endocytosis process whereby the vesicles retain their form and their content of neurotransmitter. Uh, 
If you do high frequency stimulation, in this case, these are experiments from the rat CA1 hippocampal area where we took an interest in the glutamate receptor, you will observe that immediately upon high frequency stimulation, there is a massive release of, of glutamate because there is a significant number of uh, readily releasable vesicles that will fuse with the membrane and release their content of glutamate. This will enable glutamate to diffuse to the postsynaptic membrane and interfere with the postsynaptic glutamate receptor, which induces uh, an excitatory postsynaptic potential of with high amplitude. However, over time, this process will run down because in particularly the endocytosis process cannot keep up with the need to, to remake and refill new vesicles. And therefore, there's less glutamate released and there is a decay in the amplitude of the excitatory postsynaptic potential. And that actually leads to a, a, a synaptic depression with, with chronic stimulation, as you see illustrated uh, in, in the findings uh, of, of the two experiments you have on this slide. What was measured was the ratio between the amplitude of the last and, and the first uh, postsynaptic, uh, excitatory postsynaptic potential. And as expected, it decays, as you see in black, over time. Um, and that illustrates that the, the amplitude of the, um, the EPSPs will decrease uh, in, in magnitude over time. However, in the presence of Levetiracetam or Brevaracetam, there is an increase in this synaptic depression, and you will notice that it's uh, much more potent with Brevaracetam than compared to, to Levetiracetam. However, we, we, we did another experiment which I think is, is probably even more important to show the difference between the two SV2A ligands. And that relates to low frequency stimulation where in advance of the, of the stimulation we had perfused all the slices with a vesicle dye that then will enter into the lumen of all the vesicles. Then furthermore, some of the slices were perfused with a maximal concentration of either levetiracetam or a maximal concentration of buracetam. And you can see here on the cartoon that in the presence of levetiracetam, it slows the vesicle release and, and recycling, and therefore less glutamate is released presynaptically. And this is even more evident with, with buracetam. Let me show you the actual data behind this previous uh, cartoon. What was measured was the fluorescence signal because as we, we stimulate and the vesicles release their content of neurotransmitter, they also release the content of the vesicle dye, which then because of perfusion of the slice will disappear from the slice, wherefore the fluorescence signal will decay in intensity over time as you see in black. However, in the presence of a maximal concentration of um, uh, levetiracetam, you see here in green that it, it counteracts the, the release of, of the, the, the content of the, the vesicles. And this is even much, much more uh, evident in red for buracetam. So this is likely why we've seen in the clinic that buracetam in epilepsy patients is not only active at lower doses than levetiracetam, but also seem to have an, a positive impact on pa some patients that previously failed to get a gain of treatment with levetiracetam. But it also suggests that likely buracetam and levetiracetam has a different interaction with SV2A. And we've conducted research which actually seems to, to support that notion. In particularly because we were fortunate at UCB to identify a positive allosteric modulator. And, and just to, to share with you again what a positive allosteric modulator is, you see here a cartoon in gray of a receptor. Let's call it the dopamine receptor. And you will notice that there is an autosteric ligand like that can bind to the receptor and actually lead to uh, a secondary consequence uh, enabling a, a response. And if, for instance, for the dopamine receptor, this autosteric, one autosteric ligand would certainly be dopamine itself, whereas an allosteric ligand uh, 
will bind on a separate binding site than the autosteric ligand and have an indirect impact on the action of the autosteric ligands binding with the protein because it seems to modulate the affinity of the autosteric ligand or the efficacy outcome of the binding of the ligand with the, the receptor protein. And that's exactly what we obtained with a positive allosteric modulator for SV2A that we were fortunate to discover at, at UCB. So having this positive allosteric modulator, knowing that a function of the allosteric modulator is to alter the shape of its receptor protein, and thereby impact the action of the autosteric ligands, which in the case of SV2A could be BRIV or Leviturasetam. We wanted to understand the impact of combination therapy of this allosteric modulator with either Leviturasetam or Brivaracetam. And we conducted this experiment in either recombinant tissue or in, in human cortex tissue. And we took an interest in the two key parameters for binding characteristics, namely the affinity of the ligands and their maximal number of binding sites. Interestingly, when we combined the allosteric modulator with Priveracetam, we obtained in both models a significant increase in the affinity of Priveracetam for the SV2A protein, whereas as you see in red, in the upper in the upper figure, this was not very evident for levetiracetam. In contrast, when we looked at the ability of the positive allosteric modulator to increase the maximal number the, the number of maximal binding sites, we had uh, an opposite pattern because in that case it was more levetiracetam that had the increase than brevetiracetam. And the fact that that these two uh, compounds have uh, a different impact of the shape uh, change in the SV2A protein induced by the allosteric modulator was very interesting. And, and let me just try to illustrate what, what happened. You see here in gray uh, the SV2A protein, and you see in blue the levetiracetam molecule. In a normal condition, the levetiracetam molecule binds to SV2A. However, if you have the yellow positive allosteric modulator binding on another binding site of SV2A, it alters the shape of the gray SV2A protein and thereby they uh, expose more binding site for levetiracetam. However, in the case of brevetiracetam, the, the consequence of the allosteric modulator is different. Here on the left side, you have the um, green molecule brevetiracetam, where normally it binds to the gray SV2A protein. Then if you have the yellow allosteric modulator binding to the uh, gray SV2A protein, you will see that there is an increase in the cavity of the binding sites for uh, brevetiracetam, showing that brevetiracetam actually binds with higher affinity to its binding site. So this suggests that while levetiracetam and brevetiracetam both binds to SV2A, they may be interacting with different binding zones. And to really demonstrate this at a molecular level, we did a final experiment which involved site-directed mutagenesis. And, and in that experiment, we actually looked at um, mutating amino acids that we knew normally had been involved in the binding of SV2A ligand uh, to the to the protein. And for instance, we did a number of mutations here, you see the numbers, and for all of them we could uh, show that they both reduce the binding of label brevetiracetam and label LEV to the SV2A protein. So this clearly shows us that there are overlapping binding sites on SV2A for BREV and LEV. However, we could also demonstrate with other mutations like S294 that if we apply the allosteric modulator and thereby increase the specific binding of either brevetiracetam or levetiracetam, we lose that effect of the allosteric modulator if we have the mutation of S294. And that actually illustrates that while levetiracetam and, and, and brevetiracetam has similar binding zones on SV2A, they also have different binding zones. So taken together, what I've been trying to, to share with you regarding the impact of brevetiracetam and levetiracetam on the SV2A protein 
Clearly, brevirazetam has a different uh, impact because it has a 15 to 30-fold higher SV2A affinity than levetiracetam. That seems to result in a more potent inhibition of synaptic transmission and importantly, a more effective slowing of vesicle release, which could be one reason why we have seen more efficacy in patients with brevirazetam that previously were not satisfied with treatment uh, using LEV. And that seems to reflect, actually, that brevirazetam has a different interaction with SV2A than, than levetiracetam. One thing that is not recognized often in the clinic with levetiracetam is that it has a relatively low lipophilicity and therefore a relatively low brain permeability. So when we started the program with, with brevirazetam, we wanted to identify and design a new compound that had a higher lipophilicity and a higher brain permeability. And that was, as you can see from the findings here, achieved with, with brevirazetam. In order to study the functional consequence of this, we uh, constructed uh, SV2A PET ligands and, and a very popular one of these was a UCBJ PET ligand. And we did experiments uh, following IV bolus administration to uh, two rhesus monkeys, where we IV bolus administered comparable doses of Briviac, 5 milligram per kilo, uh, IV and levetiracetam IV, 30 milligram per per kilo. And after 45 minutes of incubation with the UCB PET ligand, we administered either brevirazetam in red, levetiracetam uh, in uh, in blue, and here you have the, the control level. And it's it's very evident that brevirazetam penetrates the the BBB much faster and enter much more fast into the brain than the the blue levetiracetam. And actually, if you try to calculate the predicted half time for getting uh, into binding to the SV2A protein, it is three minutes for brevirazetam and 23 minutes for levetiracetam. But more importantly, what you really should take an interest in is the time it takes to occupy at least more than 90% of all the SV2A protein in, in the brain because that's the occupancy of SV2A that gives you the optimal efficacy of other brevirazetam and levetiracetam. And if you do that calculation, the number is about five minutes for brevirazetam and more than an hour for levetiracetam. So clearly, a cleaning, uh, uh, a clinical meaningful difference in a, with a much more rapid brain entry uh, for brevirazetam compared to, to levetiracetam. And, and for me, suggesting also, if, if you look at the acute use of, uh, of the drugs, uh, a benefit of brevirazetam, which together with this more pronounced anti-ictal effect, I think hold uh, a clear promise. And again, I, I have mentioned to you that we have differences in the anti-seizure profile of the two SV2A ligands, and let me show data from, from probably the most prominent model we have for predicting preclinically efficacy in patients with, with focal onset uh, epilepsy. And that's the uh, fully amygdala kindling model, which uh, you can apply in other mice or rats, and where there are two parameters, one being the motor seizure severity and the other being the duration of the after discharge that you record in amygdala following stimulation. When we, we assess the impact of the two drugs on motor seizure severity, it's very clear that levetiracetam only seems to have an impact on the second general, generalized seizures that has a score from five to three. Whereas in dark blue, you see with brevirazetam, we also have an impact on the, at the partial focal onset phase that has a score between one, one to three. But the difference is even more prominent if you look at the after discharge duration where in principle the light blue uh, line of levetiracetam in both models illustrate that it has no impact at all, whereas with brevirazetam we have a dose dependent effect. And that's interesting because here you are really measuring the, the anti-ictal uh, effect of, of the two drugs and brevirazetam clearly showing a, a profile superior to levetiracetam which again, together with the more rapid brain injury I just addressed, seems to suggest that, that there could be an interesting potential as uh, a drug for treatment of uh, acute seizures.
I've been focusing on the anticonvulsant effects uh, of anti-epileptic drugs during this talk, but clearly the holy grail uh, will be drugs that have anti-epileptogenic effects that can either prevent or modify the course of epilepsy. And we have had previous observations reported with levetiracetam supporting that also levetiracetam could possess antipileptogenic effects. For that reason, we, we took an interest in doing a head-to-head -head study early on between briuracetam and levetiracetam in order to assess their antipileptogenic potential in the mice corneal kindling model. In this model, we stimulate the animals twice with a stimulation that initially induced no secondary generalized seizures. But uh, with time, you see here in blue in the placebo-treated animals, there is a, a, an increase in the proportion of animals that will display secondary generalized seizures. And then finally, it reached a plateau whereby an initially non-convulsive stimulation ends up always inducing focal onset seizures with secondary generalization. In this, uh, in this protocol, we then, in advance of the, uh, admin, uh, in advance of the stimulations, administered increasing doses of either brivaracetam or levetiracetam. And clearly, both drugs were able to inhibit kindling development. However, the most important and interesting part of this study resides in the right side of the hatched line. The hatched line illustrating that after we had stimulated for about 38 stimulations, the animals had a washout period of the drug treatment and five days without any stimulation. This was then followed by new stimulations, but with no further administration of, of drugs. In that scenario, levetiracetam, previously treated animals, rapidly returned to the values seen in the placebo group. They lost their anti-epileptogenic effects, so to speak. However, if you look at the animals previously treated with brioracetam, there is a dose-dependent ability of previous brioracetam treatment to actually continuously and sustained counteract the epileptogenic process. And that's a very interesting uh, observation that we previously took to the flute percussion model uh, that was published here at the Neurocritical Care Symposium in US during September, and where we could prove um, probably the best effect ever seen in that model of brivaracetam against the development of chronic epilepsy. So clearly brivaracetam um, do have some interesting properties also with respect to, to anti-epileptogenic uh, effect that it do not seem to share with levetiracetam or probably, for that matter, any other anti-epileptic drug. So this is the, the, the key differences preclinically with, between brivaracetam and, and levetiracetam. And I, I think it, it highlights that brivaracetam, both with respect to efficacy and, uh, and adverse effect potential and antibileptogenic ethics, uh, seems to, to have benefits that is not uh, entailed in the profile of, of levetiracetam. So uh, I just want to close by, by saying that what the data I just shared with you are basically work that took up to 20 years. Uh, I tried to summarize within 40 minutes, which wasn't easy. Um, but, but certainly, one thing I really have to share is that I'm so happy and so proud I was part of that really remarkable journey that took us from levetiracetam to buracetam, and I'm very grateful for you taking the time to listen to this story. Thank you very much. You may unmute yourself and um, ask questions now. That was very Doctor. nice. We, we enjoyed it and look forward to um, hearing some of the questions. Yeah, I have a question about um, Riviac and yes. Is that going through? I'm hey, sorry. Um, can you hear me? It's a little better now, yes. 
Uh, I, I had a question about um, Breviact and status. You mentioned it in Rhesus Monkeys. Do you know of any um, group that's doing uh, trials in humans directly comparing Keppra versus Breviact in status epilepticus treatments? No, I uh, first of all, we have done preclinical work, and I, I had to skip it because of, of the time limitations I have. But Claude Vasterlein at UCLA has compared uh, levetiracetam and brioracetam in his uh, animal model of status epilepticus. And, and long story short, uh, brioracetam could uh, significantly reduce the convulsive seizures following a uh, start of a status epilepticus at therapeutic relevant concentrations, whereas this was not the case for levetiracetam. So, so supporting a more strong anti-ictal effect of, of uh, brioracetam compared to levetiracetam. I'm not aware of any head-to-head -head comparisons in the clinic, but I'm aware of, of reports that uh, show the uh, the benefit of having used levetiracetam as a second line add-on in uh, in status. Thank you, Dr. Kilgard. I have a question. Um, a lot of us clinicians notice the um, really good efficacy in patients that have brain tumors in terms of treating their new onset seizures, uh, maintenance therapy, and sometimes status epilepticus when it present. Is there any data to show the um, um, really the density of SV2A receptors um, around uh, tumors or on tumors uh, compared to other sites of the brain like hippocampus or any other neocortical cortex? That's a great question. And there actually is one study that looked at the density uh, of SV2A proteins among the patients with, with tumor-induced epilepsy. And they could demonstrate a correlation between the efficacy of levetiracetam and the density of SV2A, meaning the more SV2A, the more efficacy of levetiracetam. So uh, long story short, I think the reason that, that there is so far a very good experience with levetiracetam in, uh, in that type of, of epilepsy population is the fact that, that that the disease leads to, an, in general, an overexpression of SV2A. Did the study narrow down tumors to a certain type, like GBM versus astrocytoma or oligodendroglioma? Was it just brain tumors in general? You you are challenge, challenging my memory too much. <laughs> no, no, I'm saying this, saying this while joking. It, it's, it's a long time ago since I, I read the details of the study. What, what, the, the, the message I still remember because it was a very important paper for me was the fact that they really could demonstrate the correlation between SV2A density and efficacy. Uh, but this, the, the tumor types, honestly, I, I don't recall, uh, I don't recall the details. Thank you very much. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kilgard. It was very nice. Um, I like the comparison between levetiracetam and brevetiracetam uh, since we're using it so much in the uh, clinical practice, and I hope everybody got away with something. It's definitely been new information for me. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you for the talk. Really enjoyed it.